welcome to session two of Words and Music 2020, City of a Million Dreams. This is a book called City of a Million Dreams that then inspired a film by the same name. I had the pleasure of visiting the author slash filmmaker, Jason Barry at his home and seeing this film in its raw form a few months back. It's incredible. You guys are going to love hearing about how this book got translated onto the screen. If you like what you see, don't forget to donate to the festival. All of the ways to do that are in the comments. So without further ado, I am going to introduce Jason Berry and Dr. Michael White. Welcome. Thank you. Wonderful to be with you. Thank you very much. Great to be here. So I'm just going to say a few words, and then we're going to show the trailer for the film. <laughs> the book, uh, City of a Million Dreams, is a history of New Orleans at year 300. The argument of the book is that the beguiling personality of the city is shaped by a long conflict between a culture of spectacle rooted in the dances of enslaved Africans at Congo Square and a city of laws that for most of our history was anchored in white supremacy. I began working on the film quite a number of years ago, shooting jazz funerals before I really had an idea of where I was going with it structurally. And then um, Hurricane Katrina hit, uh, which was a disaster, of course, for everyone. Dr. Michael White, who is the protagonist of the film, suffered terrible losses during the hurricane. We filmed him going through his house at the time. So it took quite a while to get the film back on track. In the meantime, I, I kept researching and I uh, published uh, the book, which uh, happy to hold up. <laughs> it's, uh, it's available uh, at stores near you or Amazon or Biblio. And the paperback will be out in February. So I guess if you want to show the trailer, then Michael and I can begin our dialogue. We celebrate and laugh at death. We're sad because you're not here anymore. But we're happy because you're going to a better reward. No place else in the United States is gonna let black people take over the streets, you know, every Sunday for four hours long. It's just not gonna happen. someone dealing with American racism, trying to find your place in this life and society, you can be transformed into another world that really sets you free. This spirit goes back to Congo Square. Many of the slaves believed that when they died, they would go back to Africa. Those enslaved Africans here in New Orleans, the culture was never obliterated the way it was in the rest of the American South. the groups that came here. Music and funerals went together in all of these cultures. Gotta have music, gotta have a parade, gotta look good when you die. It's really a combination of European and African, which makes it American. But New Orleans has always been a hazardous place to live. It's hard to survive here. I don't do anything else before I leave here. I need to do what I can to repair the world. After Katrina hit, there was that question on the table, are we even going to fund rebuilding New Orleans? 
One of the things that would have been lost is this tradition. We need to hold on to our culture. That's the enduring lesson of the jazz funeral. Return again in another life and it will be jubilant. We do this in their ancestral memory. Well, there we are, a small uh, example of the film. It's now in post-production and we expect to be finished uh, by the end of the year. And then we're entering film festivals and hoping for a good uh, distribution agreement uh, in 2021. Maybe the best way to start our uh, time together is for me to ask the protagonist of the film, Dr. Michael White, um, what are the high points of this project, which has taken so many years, in your mind? Well, <clears throat> first of all, let me just kind of introduce myself for people that might not know me. Uh, yeah, I'm Michael White. I'm a New Orleans-born uh, clarinetist, uh, jazz musician, jazz historian, uh, writer, program coordinator, composer, band leader, and a few other things that we won't mention right now. <laughs> but um, uh, I've been playing in New Orleans uh, for over 45 years, and uh, I started out in brass bands and playing um, a lot of brass band functions. So it was over 20, 25 years now, Jason, <clears throat> when we started. Yeah, the film. first video interview we did, I think, was in 1997. <laughs> wow, that's, yeah, that's going pretty far back. So um, I was happy to see... Uh, elements of this uh, New Orleans music documented because a lot of the things I saw were uh, passing. I started performing during the last days of uh, the more traditional style being a part of the social club parades, jazz funerals, and the now extinct uh, church parade tradition. So uh, when Jason uh, approached me about the film, I was very excited about it. I thought that uh, it was very important to show the the African roots of the tradition and how uh, it is in every sense of the word an American tradition because of the African roots and their blending with uh, European traditions as many things did in African-American culture. And I think this is one of the more important and vibrant cultures in American history. And, you know, a lot of the world didn't know about it, uh, still doesn't know about it. And it needs to be documented and expressed because uh, what we have captured here in the film talks about uh, a, a unique version of the American experience. And it is um, done in a way that could only be done in New Orleans because of the cultural blends and the history that we have here. And I think, uh, you know, this film does a, an excellent job of of going back and looking at traditions like Congo Square, uh, and and looking at the the Mardi Gras Indians and and all these different um, blends that we've had and uh, different uh, versions of African culture mixed with European culture and yet coming up in a way that's uniquely um, New Orleans, but but still vibrant traditions that continue, you know, from what over a hundred years ago into the present. Uh, with many generations, and they have a, an essential central meaning about the value and importance of life that everyone in the world can learn from. So this is this is really important to to, to capture this. And what I like is that <clears throat> Jason has used the uh, as as much as possible authentic uh, events, authentic people, uh, the essence of people. And over the years, because the film has gone back so far, uh, a number of important people. Uh, who were interviewed and seen in the film are no longer with us. Right. So that adds to the to the value of the film. Well, I appreciate your thoughts, uh, your reflections. Um, I would add something to that. Um, 
Funerals in New Orleans, I think, are caravans of memory. Every funeral with music, that's the term used by the jazz men uh, in the age before television. Every funeral with music really tells a story about a given neighborhood, obviously the person who died, the family of that person. But the music that is played uh, is also a sort of mirror on society at a given point in time. One of the really uh, fascinating revelations to me in working on the book, um, the book, by the way, is a general history of the city. And it begins with the founding of New Orleans and ends uh, with the Confederate statues coming down uh, with a long section, you know, after Hurricane Katrina. But I discovered, I was trying to figure out when was the first identified funeral with music. And, you know, when you write a work of narrative history, you're always aware that there's somebody back there with a trench coat who's following you, who's going to say, aha, he says in his book it was, you know, uh, 1789. In fact, I found this piece of paper that says it was 1766. Fortunately, that guy or that woman has not come along yet in my life. But the, the funeral that fascinated me in my research on the early history of the city was in 1789 for Carlos III, who was the king of Spain. New Orleans was a Spanish colony at that time, and the king died. He had put a great deal of money into New Orleans, rebuilding it, and there had been a terrible fire just uh, a year before the fire of 1788 that destroyed almost three quarters of the city. So the word comes four months after the monarch dies in Madrid, the word reaches New Orleans, and and they announce, well, we have to have a, a ceremony for the king. The king is dead. Long live the new king, Carlos IV. Well, the Cabildo has an amazing record of this event that was translated from the Spanish back in the 1930s by the Work Progress Associate, Work Projects Association, the Writers Project, you know, during the New Deal. And it's a remarkably detailed account of all of these people processing through the streets of what is left of this badly burned city with the Spanish uh, orchestral musicians leading the way. And there is no account of what music they played, but what fascinated me was that the Cabildo scribes referred to the people who were processing, who were marching, as, quote, the illustrious body, capital I, capital B. These were the notable people of the city. And so, you know, as the generations passed, the many descendants of the illustrious body kept marching. And after the Civil War, the tradition of, of ring dances um, at Congo Square opened out into these flowing lines of dancers, the people we today call the second line, the second liners. And so it's really a story of the coming together of the ring, the African ring of memory, and the line, the linear procession of European marches uh, and marching music that historically was used to ennoble the dead. Michael, I wonder if you could tell us something about the cultural dynamics of Congo Square and how that has influenced your music. Well, you know, as a, as a kid, we come up in New Orleans hearing about Congo Square. And, you know, it was much later when I learned uh, a lot more about Congo Square, uh, you know, even into a fairly recent book by uh, Freddie Evans. It's really, really great. Um, talking about the, the importance of Congo Square and what happened, what went on there. I think Congo Square symbolically is extremely important because it represents a maintaining of African traditions, not only because it was the only place in the South where there was, you know, large public gatherings that were 
allowed. And in fact, public spectacles and, you know, tourists would flock and there were uh, reportedly as many as 600 enslaved uh, Africans at a time forming circle, uh, forming circles and dancing, depending on which uh, ethnicity and region they came from in Africa. And it, what's important about Congo Square is it established a practice of uh, maintaining African music traditions, but also allowing for them to evolve and transform. So we know, for example, that there were uh, various types of recreated African instruments. Uh, they are drums and different string instruments, some of them related to the, the banjo. Uh, but we also know that that tradition uh, evolved and set the foundation as, you know, English language influenced, uh, European music influenced, uh, black people, all of those things kind of, uh, helped the evolution of Congo square. And that set the foundation for a very important tradition that we have in New Orleans culture of improvisation, uh, of an incorporation of musical ideas as, as well as other ideas and blend them together and come up with something new and exciting. And if there's one thing that you could say that sort of defines traditions like uh, the social club parade traditions, brass bands, Mardi Gras Indians, it is, is, it is exactly that, that way that we take and incorporate uh, different cultural aspects from Africa, from Europe, we blend them with our own personal experiences. We allow those traditions to evolve. We let those traditions stand as a symbol of identity um, and vibrancy. And then we, and then they serve as a way of not only communicating communication, but also as a way of bonding. And then we take and pass those traditions on to uh, later generations. And that's you know that's one of the incredible things. And once again, I mean you know. I think that's one of the important things that you've captured in the film, Jason. And I think that, you know, that's that's a, 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 a very valuable thing that the world needs to see. I, I agree with you, Michael, about <laughs> the world needing to see it. We hope it does happen in large numbers. I just want to say one thing kind of as an echo of what uh, Michael just said. When we were working on this film, um, the editor, Tim Watson, the co-producer, my daughter, Simonette Berry, and I laid very careful groundwork over many months for filming a reenactment of the dances at Congo Square. Uh, a great deal of research went into that. this. In fact, Freddie Evans, whose book Michael uh, just mentioned, was one of our uh, advisors, one of our consultants. And... Um, we filmed uh, in the fall of 2018 at a large field in, field in Bell Chase uh, with help from the Plaquemines Parish um, government. Uh, they were most helpful in giving us access to the area where we filmed. And um, the choreographer of this sequence, which flows through the film in several episodes, uh, is Monique Moss, who is an African-American scholar and dance artist uh, at Tulane. And also Seganon Kone, who is a master drummer and dancer and instrumentalist from the Ivory Coast, who lives in New Orleans. And in fact, he and Michael uh, collaborated on a CD. I believe it's called Adventures in New Orleans Music. Am I right? Adventures in New Orleans Jazz, yes. Excuse me, New Orleans Jazz. So Saginaw and Monique helped us create um, the concept, the moving concept that we wanted to show um, with a series of rehearsals uh, the week before we filmed. Um, we had several uh, percussionists um, from Ivory Coast who uh, live in New York and Maryland who joined us, and a very important uh, drummer and um, cultural figure from Congo, uh, Tito Sampa, who was living uh, outside Detroit at the time, and I'm happy to say he has since moved to New Orleans and is establishing himself here. 
uh, also his brother Bizo and a couple of other people. So we had a retinue of musicians from several African uh, countries and traditions, along with local percussive artists, um, Bill Summers being one of them, uh, Luther Gray uh, being another. And the, the dancers, all uh, local artists here in New Orleans, Jarrell Hamilton, one of them, many others, I, I, I'm afraid if I name one, I should name them all, and that would be a little tough right now. But um, the work really was, a, I would say, a, quite a spiritual experience for everyone involved. We were deeply aware uh, that we were trying to capture the past in a way that a film can do, but only through the imagination and the hard work of historical research. Uh, and, and I think we did a pretty good job of it. Um, the other thing I wanted to say is that the, the second figure in this film, who is a, uh, a central figure, kind of a, a counter protagonist to Michael's role, is um sorry my cell phone's ringing look <laughs> adventures in live stream culture um uh okay okay <laughs> anyway uh uh deb cotton was a blogger um a chronicler of the social aid and pleasure clubs a remarkable person who lived in New Orleans for a number of years. And she is um, in counterpoint, you might, might say, uh, to the story of Michael and the carrying of the brass band culture that he represents. I want to ask you something else. Um, you mentioned earlier that some of the musicians who are in the film are no longer with us. I think particularly of Milton Baptiste, who was the trumpeter of the Olympia, and Harold Dejan, who for many years led the band. In fact, it was called Dejan's Olympia. I wonder if you could give us a, a cameo or a thumbnail sketch on each of those men and the importance um, that they have today in the memory and life of the music. Well, yeah, uh, you know, both Harold Dejon and Milton Baptiste represent very important aspects in the continuity of uh, New Orleans brass band traditions. Harold Dejon was born before 1910, and he was an older, experienced musician yeah. that came up with and learned from, you know, second, the formative second generation of jazz men. Uh, he was ju born just a few years after Louis Armstrong. And Harold Dejon spent most of his musical career uh, in the city. And in the late 1950s, it's hard to believe when we think about it now, but as exciting as brass band music is, the first brass band records did not actually come along until the 1950s. And uh, in the late 1950s, but uh, this sparked a renewal of interest in New Orleans brass bands. And eventually, uh, Harold Dejon saw the opportunity for, you know, brass band work. So he reformed an old name, the Olympia, which was an old brass band name. So he reformed the Olympia brass band as Dejon's Olympia. And the Olympia became uh, the most popular brass band in the city for over two decades in the 60s, the 70s, and, and you know, into the 80s. The, the Olympia brass band became like a brand name. Uh, a lot of people thought all brass bands were called Olympia. It's like Coke and Kleenex, you know. <laughs> but, um, the Olympia became a symbol of the brass band tradition. Now, they did perform in black community events, jazz funerals, social club parades, uh, you know, church parades. But the Olympia was one of the bands that was used. It was actually the main brass band used to promote tourism in the city. And so they were brought around not only America, but all over the world. Uh, and that was a big boost to the tourist industry, you know, for people coming here for authentic New Orleans music. So 
Harold Dijon was very important in that sense. He 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 founded a brass band that became not only very popular, but came to symbolize New Orleans music around the world. Milton Baptiste was of a younger generation, the rhythm and blues generation. And, you know, he was a very strong and powerful man. He helped uh, Harold Dijon to lead the band when, you know, Harold was getting older and Milton was the assistant leader. And so Milton really directed the band. And part of his direction was really to bring in some of the influences that he uh, that he knew from rhythm and blues. So musically, he made some changes that started uh, the process of brass band evolution, uh, getting it really going by uh, doing a number of things. Like he used to always, as he was playing the trumpet, he used to also always play the tambourine. Uh, but he also uh, introduced a number of of songs uh, that were not considered traditional jazz songs or brass band numbers, but he made them into brass band numbers. And so they, they became classics and the foundation for, for again, change and continuity in the brass band tradition. Songs like uh, Professor Longhair's Come to the Mardi Gras or the song It Ain't My Fault. Uh, you know, they did a number of songs like that and kind of changed the style, but also opened the door and they opened the door for change as well because they they were the first brass band to move into the commercial arena. And as such, uh, they made changes that, you know, accommodated uh, commercial tastes like flashier colored uniforms, smaller bands, um, things like that. So uh, the, the Olympia was a very important model that other brass bands followed. And I, I was I had the chance to play with the Olympia many times. Actually, I played with them. Yeah, uh, in funerals, I, I remember playing with them <laughs> in a Mardi Gras Indian parade. I remember playing with them in the Zulu Club parade for for Mardi Gras, and and other events. You know, so um, <clears throat> that was a, a very important group. And Harold Dejon and Milton Baptiste, both uh, independently and individually, um, were very important in continuing and furthering the brass band tradition. And again, it's very important that you. Or have them in the film because again they were the most popular band to play jazz funerals uh, in the 1960s and 70s. You know, uh, I had a conversation some years ago with Milton. Um, I think he died about 10 years ago, if I'm, I'm not mistaken. But and he had a beautiful funeral. Um, but he told me that some of the changes they began to make uh, when the band really got moving, um, they, they, uh, sort of eased out of some of the older, uh, brass band songs, which reflected the military origins of this tradition songs like, uh, Washington post under the durable Eagle, I believe was another one he cited. And they embraced in, instead, uh, songs like blueberry Hill that fats domino, uh, made famous, and as you said, you know, Professor Longhair's anthem. So, in a sense, you know, I said earlier that funerals are caravans of memory. The brass bands carry memory as well, not just in the way that the repertoires will evolve and shift over time, but in the in the instrumental attack and in the way in which the music is played. Um, I remember Dick Allen, the former uh, curator of the Jazz Archive at Tulane, once told me that some of the funerals he followed in the late 1950s, I guess early 1960s, he said it was amazing to hear the trombonists who were playing in unison and kind of riffing off each other, these mini call and response patterns within the larger flow of the song. And I don't know if we really have that level of nuance today. I'm not saying that we don't have other nuances, but one of the other things that I'm curious about um, after the many years that we've worked on this project together, but you now play in the Young Tuxedo, as a marching band, and you have your own band, uh, the the original Liberty. Um, what is the crossover in the repertoire between 
a marching band and a band such as yours, which you know performs for dances or uh, occasions, Tulane graduation every year and the many other gigs that you have. Well, let me let me just say we I have two bands. I have the original Liberty Jazz Band, but I also have a my, my own brass band is the Liberty Brass Band. Oh. And, um, you know, the reason I formed the brass band was because the older brass band tradition was kind of dying out. And I wanted a group not to perform as much in, in social club parades, but to perform for special events. And so the Liberty Brass Band has been going really since 1985, 85, yes. And um, so, and we, we've done a number of events. We've traveled all over the world, actually. Um, but the thing is that what you were referring to uh, in terms of the trombones playing in harmony and all, <clears throat> that goes back to two very important aspects of the tradition that were or kind of lost today or disappearing. One is that <clears throat> the brass bands, part of the foundation of brass band playing was marches. And marches were, you know, people that may have uh, uh, performed, may have played instruments in high school or college might remember marches as being the, the toughest thing that you had to play, the toughest type of song. Marches have, you know, several different parts. They might have changes of key, changes of volume, changes of mood. <laughs> intricate parts that kind of blend together. And so the foundation of that laid out sort of guidelines, if you will, for harmony. In fact, marches were, in terms of structure, were a foundation of a very important uh, black music form, ragtime. The, the structural uh, form, format of marches uh, became the structural format in general of ragtime with, of course, other elements like uh, syncopated rhythms and what have you. But that was one thing. The marches created a sort of um, written march parts were written, often written in harmony. Huh. So you would have like, for example, a trumpet playing the lead where you might have three trumpet parts. You know, one is playing the melody and the other two are playing harmony notes in the same rhythm that give a thicker, fuller texture to the music. So the European march tradition was very, very important in brass bands. And in New Orleans, I mean, a lot of the early brass bands, black brass bands were actually reading before jazz came along. That's all they did, they read. They were reading standard written scores like their white counterparts. But when jazz started, the, the combination of improvisation and what was left of that you know, written, legacy because that written legacy was perpetuated by a number of black uh, music teachers who taught a lot of early jazz musicians how to read music and gave them lessons. But um, so that was very important. It was very important <clears throat> that the legacy of parts and understanding how parts work be became part of the New Orleans jazz tradition early on. So yeah, when I when I started playing in the brass bands, it was the last days of that old style. And part of that old style was you had three part trumpet harmony and you had trombones that played riffs together. And, you know, it, it just gave the music a whole nother kind of rich layer and texture. But I think what, what we don't talk about a lot and is very important here is, is purpose. I think back then there was, when jazz was created, I think the need for uh, African-Americans to demonstrate how democracy really works by incorporating different ideas, cultures, personalities, possibility, and using freedom of ideas, freedom of improv, of, of uh, well, uh, improvisation, etc. Those were very important in in kind of symbolizing, you know, what African Americans were fighting for in society. They showed how African traditions, European traditions, personal uh, emotions, feelings, personal creativity could all blend together and coexist together in unity and harmony and make for a greater presence. So that was pointing to a greater world, a greater country. <laughs> but um, I think that, uh, so that was one of the things that was, that, that we don't have today. You know, brass bands today are not playing watches. But I think you can say that 
the brass bands today are playing to suit the needs of the present community, which is what brass bands did back then. And the other thing is what, what I mentioned before was the fact that there was this strong tradition of teaching. When you played in brass bands before, a lot of the musicians, you didn't just have a bunch of kids that form a brass band or whatever. You, you had uh, established groups and younger people were sort of blended into the tradition and mentored in, in the tradition by older musicians who would tell you what was what, whether you're talking about a reading band or improvising band or one that kind of did a little of both. So that that was very important at, that you had that older mentoring tradition that you don't, you know, you don't really have today as well. So, so those were the differences. But yeah, you had a different musical thing, but the reason was because of musical foundation and and purpose, as I said. You know, you mentioned the the birth of jazz. I uh, I have a long chapter on on how jazz arose, and I treat it in historical terms as a counter narrative to the mythology of the lost cause. This was the movement that spread through the South uh, after the Civil War, particularly during Reconstruction, which was the war after the war where so much uh, bloody retribution was taken out on people of color and the white power structure regained its, its strength, uh, you know, by vigilante tactics and lynching. The lost cause was the idea, and you see it in the movie Gone with the Wind, that the South was this noble place that was kind to its darkies and the, the war was a misunderstanding over economics, which of course is not true. The war was fought over slavery and, and to free the enslaved. Well, the music that emerged in these rural communities in the 1880s, the church music, uh, jubilee dancing, uh, ecstatic uh, cries and rhythms migrated with some 40,000 African Americans between 1880 and 1900 who came to New Orleans. This was one of two great waves of migration um, culminating at the turn of the, the last century. And the other was the Sicilians who came in even greater numbers, uh, fleeing the, the dreadful po poverty of Southern Italy. And so what you have, Michael mentioned the music teachers who were so important. One of the most uh, impressive ones in my research was James Brown Humphrey. He was a, a, a multi-instrumentalist, uh, a musical professor who uh, in the 1880s would travel to outlying towns by train uh, along the old plantation belt. And he was hired to teach uh, the workers in those communities. They were no longer slaves, but they were still uh, workers, some of them sharecroppers, teach them how to play music. And the idea was that if, if these black people had bands, if they had music, they would be more willing to stay where they were living. Well, in fact, many of them who were taught by Professor Humphrey left the country, came into the city and became brass band musicians. He was, he was a catalytic figure in the birth of jazz and he's not very well known. The other point that I make in the book, and, and we, I have distilled this somewhat in directing the film, is that the movement of these people and this music, this African-American music, into a melting pot city filled with Irish, with Germans, with Sicilians, with so many other ethnic Americans, became a kind of a cultural force, a cultural channel that other people found themselves drawn to. And you, you, you think about a song as central to the New Orleans identity, as when the saints go marching in. The version we hear today that is so popular is largely based on the 1938 recording by Louis Armstrong, in which he plays the role of a preacher in a church, calling out different members of the band. Here comes the trombonist. 
and then they play the up-tempo version. Well, in fact, the Saints has a much older, longer history. It was often sung in very slow tempo, almost like a spiritual. <laughs> and the lyrics, the original lyrics, uh, draw strongly from the book of Revelation, which is the story of the apocalypse, of the forces of heaven led by Jesus, you know, the forces of darkness led by Satan. And those lyrics talk about when the moon, when the moon begin to shine, when the blood, when the blood, when the blood falls down, when the trumpet, trumpet, trumpet goes up. It's, it's almost in cameo, the story of an army getting ready to go to war. And as the song evolved, and obviously lyrics are changed as songs come down over time, it really became an anthem of celebration, of striding toward freedom. And jazz in many ways in its origins represented the movement toward a new horizon. Slavery was now 30, 40 years past. People were moving into the city. Even though New Orleans was crowded, it had terrible problems of congestion, of yellow fever because of the stagnant water. Nevertheless, it was the promised land to many of these folks. And when you think about the, the joy streams of the early music, the up-tempo songs and the way in which they got people up and dancing, it was fundamentally dance music. Many of those songs are almost like stories about the city as it was changing. And you find that in particularly in the funerals. There's, there's sort of a myth that Storyville, the red light district, you know, was the incubator of jazz. Well, from 19, 1897 to 1917, Storyville was indeed a major venue for many musicians the Bordello district. But at the same time, many of those musicians who played the sawdust spattered floors of the cabarets by night in the afternoons or early evenings could be found sitting in churches as the sermons were being given for someone who had died. And then in escorting uh, the cortege out into the street, they took the hymns of those pews and fashioned them into marching songs. Um, the saints was one of them. And the military um, repertoire of many of these uh, European bands that dated well back into the uh, 19th century, as far back as the early 19th century, that repertoire as it had evolved really began to change in the first two decades or so of the 20th century, just as it changed again when Milton Baptiste and Mr. Dejan came along and got rid of some of the older marches and added uh, rhythm and blues songs. But the importance of jazz is, excuse me, the importance of the funerals to jazz is that they added a sacred element to what was I don't want to say profane, but there was certainly a lot of hot stuff going on in Storyville that the musicians witnessed and sometimes played for. Michael, I wonder if in your career you have had cause to take some of the older songs, be they blues or uh, religious songs, and rearrange them uh, into dance music. Well, you know that whole idea of uh, the whole idea of uh, the hymns comes from the the influence of the church. The influence of the church in jazz is 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 very important. It goes even back to the the beginning with Buddy Bolden and his generation. Yeah. And you know, like you said, a lot of the uh, church hymns uh, uh, were songs that were played, but also. Uh, very important was church singing. Buddy Bolden was among the first to start that idea of adding the shouts and the vibrato and the bent tones and the emotion and the use of the call and response. All of these main characteristics of black church singing 
uh, he incorporated that into horn playing and performance. And, you know, that was one of the main elements of, of, of early jazz. So the influence of the church in terms of repertoire and also characteristics, you know, can't be um, um, overstated. Also, um, you know, hymns go way back. I mean, I, I think, well, one of the things I also want to, to kind of add to is while there was jazz in Storyville, there were a lot of early jazz musicians that, and, and the music wasn't in the brothels, it was in the club yeah. in Storyville, right. contrary to myth. But um, a lot of the musicians never actually never played in Storyville. They were playing a lot of other types of functions, picnics, dances, um, weddings, parades, funerals, uh, boat rides, uh, sporting events of all types, uh, advertising wagons, all of those kinds of things. Now, um, in terms of church hymns, the hymns go way back because a lot of early jazz songs were influenced by church hymns, but the brass bands always had uh, two main sources of playing, uh, reasons for playing uh, hymns. One was, of course, jazz funerals. And in the funeral, of course, you played, you know, slow hymns, dirges, and as well as up-tempo hymns. But there was also this now extinct tradition of church parades. And, you know, when I came along, I played during the last years of church parades. And that is a part of jazz people don't really talk about or know about a lot. But at the insistence of reverends, it were usually Baptist church parades that went on on Sunday mornings. They lasted about uh, about an hour, one to two hours. Uh, they were much smaller and much more sedate than the more rocker second lines. Uh, but they went through the same community neighborhoods and in New Orleans and surrounding communities. And the church parades at the insistence of reverends only had up-tempo hymns. And I remember on several occasions, the, the reverend coming to the band leader before the parade and said, now look, this is this is a church parade. We respect in the Lord. None of that jazz out here. You hear just hymns. Okay. And we played hymns, up-tempo, no slow hymns like in the funerals, but always up-tempo hymns. But they were always done with the same jazz style as in the social club parades. And so, I mean, and it was always funny to see the church members strutting along gracefully, trying not to just break out into a wild second line dance. But, you know, that improvisation and the reverend was, hap was happy and everybody was happy. But that improvisation in the in the hymns and the jazz using those same vocal elements that came from the church was 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 very important. Now, they started recording hymns. Um, in the late 1920s. Uh, the first recorded hymns came from Sam Morgan's jazz band. Sam Morgan had one of the most popular uh, dance bands in the area, and he had the chance, he was one of the few that had the chance to record in New Orleans during the 1920s, and uh, he recorded about eight songs, and three of those were hymns done in up-tempo jazz style over in the glory land, down by the riverside, and sing on. So those were from 1927, the first recorded hymns. And since then, up-tempo hymns in regular jazz performance became sort of like a regular thing, especially during what was known as the New Orleans revival of the 1940s, when a lot of older New Orleans jazz musicians were recorded for the first time. Bunk Johnson, George Lewis, uh, later on, Kid Thomas Valentine, Kid Howard, people like that. And so they started recording hymns regularly and then that became a regular part of performance so we still you know play hymns all the time michael uh, as you were speaking I, I couldn't help but think and i hope that the uh, the viewers who are with us today will appreciate this but as he was describing um those church parades when he was coming up as a young jazz man we discovered some absolutely beautiful footage of the Doc Pauline marching band, the group that Michael eventually played with, um, at the historic New Orleans collection. Um, this is footage that was shot by the late Jules Kahn, a much beloved figure, uh, well remembered by uh, jazz aficionados and others uh, here in town. And we've used that footage in the film uh, alongside one of Michael's interviews to underscore uh, the role that this religious stream 
within the culture had in the in the evolution of the music and in the evolution of the funerals. Um, you know, something else I'm, I'm curious about, the songs that many of us of a certain age <laughs> grew up with, uh, Rhythm and Blues, you know, is sung by oh, Aaron Neville, Irma Thomas, Alan Toussaint, and others. R&B was the big surge of popular music in the 50s and, and 60s. But New Orleans style, which is the term used for traditional jazz, has really been making quite a comeback in the last 25 or 30 years. Uh, everybody thinks it's dying or it's old museum music, but in fact, it, it keeps growing. And there are now quite a number of younger musicians who are working within this tradition um, and, and even a couple in middle age, such as you. I've, but it's so interesting to me that people are composing songs in what we call traditional jazz or New Orleans style. You have been composing songs in this idiom for some years. We have a few minutes left. Uh, I wonder if you could tell us a little bit. I mean, in a sense, aren't you competing with the great ghosts of Jelly Roll Morton, Louis Armstrong, and others. I mean, how does that feel? <laughs> well, well, yes and no. I'm 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 influenced and inspired by Armstrong and Jelly Roll, and and you know they remain primary influences, and and uh, you know uh, they set the bar that you try to <laughs> constantly try to get to. But um, one of the things that I came to realize about traditional music when I was a younger musician, I, I played with over three dozen musicians who were born between the late 1890s and 1910. And they taught me quite a lot. I mean, everything about the music, some more formally than others, but each one of them was a stylist and an individual uh, musical per personality. And I learned so much uh, from them that I could not have learned anywhere else. But one of the things that happened when they all, all the older guys died, because I used to really hang out with them, guys my age or even in the Fats Domino generation <laughs> were too, too young for me to hang out with, uh, even swing era guys. But I used to hang out with these old, old people all the time. I don't know. Somehow we were on the same plane. I don't know what that means. But um, when they all died, each time it was like losing a relative, but it was also like losing a part of the music. And... You know, I've never only been, as I've been accused of being sometimes, I'm, I've never only been stuck in the 1920s or whatever. I mean, I always listen to contemporary music and music of all types, and I love music of all types. And that music is in my head. And what finally started to happen is I realized it's like gumbo. All the music I've ever heard is just kind of simmering around somewhere. And musical ideas started to come up. So at some point, I was always challenged with, well, what are you trying to contribute to the tradition. I mean, what do you mean contribute? You know, that was always a question. And finally, I realized that, you know, New Orleans jazz is not just a set of, of songs. It's not a repertoire just like the Saints or Bourbon Street Parade. It, it It's that, but it can also be a music that continues using the musical principles of the style to create new music that represents our time. So in a sense, I use the emotion of today, my own personal experience, current events, blends with other ethnic folk musics like reggae, African music, uh, uh, Caribbean music, uh, but use them through the lens of and, and the principles of traditional New Orleans jazz. And I've been writing dozens and dozens of songs and still into, into the present. So what I realize is that this music can stay alive using what happens, you know, things that Jelly Roll Morton, Louis Armstrong, Sidney Bechet, Johnny Dodge, George Lewis never saw, never experienced. Uh, the civil rights movement of the 60s, uh, Hurricane Katrina, um, uh, political turmoil, uh, you know, some of the current events today are going on, uh, 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 you know, like police violence, racial episodes. You can use the emotions and feelings from all of those things or your own personal life, illness, love, you know, and create new songs in the language of New Orleans jazz. So I do that every day. And I might I might use influences from, you know, everybody from uh, 
uh, rappers to, to rock and roll musicians, to rhythm and blues musicians, to modern jazz musicians. And they are little pieces and bits, but again, they're translated into New Orleans jazz. So that, that helps quite a lot. And, and through that, that helps to keep the music alive in another way. Now, I will say that concept is still kind of revolutionary, but we're working on, you know, making this idea of a, a, a more contemporary canon, not necessarily a sound that sounds like, you know, dominant rhythm and blues or dominant modern jazz, but sounds like New Orleans jazz, but different from what King Oliver did, from what Louis Armstrong did. Well, in fact, uh, we don't really hear performed today uh, much of the music of King Oliver and Armstrong in the in the early era. It's far more common to hear, you know, the songs that uh, Louis made famous, uh, you know, the Saints, uh, uh, well, Hello Dolly is, I don't know if it's played locally that much, but it is. Uh, yeah, Not I think it is. And uh, Wonderful World, among others. Uh, well, one of the myths that people don't realize is the music of the 1920s, Jelly Roll Morton, uh, the early Louis Armstrong Hot Five and Seven, Johnny Dodds, Jimmy Noon, Kid Ory, uh, 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 Punch Miller, a, a lot of the stuff these guys were playing, Clarence Williams was a lot harder <laughs> than the, the other stuff, the Saints and stuff is a lot well, simpler. The idea of, of, of four, six, eight, ten musicians playing music with these improvisational lines but sticking to the rudder of melody and then moving in and out, uh, you know, with choruses and breaks, it is, structurally, it's very demanding music if you've never played it or if you're just learning it. But when it's achieved at that level, it's really just a thing of beauty. It, and it's wonderful dance music. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, it's harder to do with a 10-piece brass band than it is with a seven-piece, you know, the conventional seven-piece jazz band. But at the same time, I mean, the, the concept is the same. Uh, you, can't, you can't really change as much with the brass band. You know, you, of course, they had marches that were intricate and they played rags and blues and jazz songs of all kinds in brass bands. But what Jelly Roll Morton did, I mean, he raised the music to a very high artistic peak, you know, in, in ways as, in terms of composition, in ways like Louis Armstrong did in terms of improvisation and ways that King Oliver did in terms of a cohesive collective improvisation based band style. You know, they all contributed very important elements and aspects to the music that, again, we can all use today and, you know, make new music. So I think we have just maybe two minutes left. So let me feed you a couple of questions from left field. When you're not composing and you're not <laughs> deeply engaged in your research, what kind of music do you listen to just to kind of... Well, you know, people like, I listen to everything. I listen to everything. I listen to pop music, rhythm and blues. I heard something by by uh, on the radio the other day. I went, went to the dentist and I was in the chair and they had this pop music on. And I heard something by this this lady, pop singer named Lord, L-O-R-D-E. <laughs> and uh, I thought it was interesting. What I thought was interesting about it was the structure of the song. And I was like, oh, I like the way those chord changes go. So I'm going to use that. Last night I was listening to Michael Jackson and uh, Diana Ross, you know, but I listen to everything, all New Orleans music, classical music these days, um, rhythm and blues, modern jazz. I love lately. I've been listening to um, uh, a lot of Lee Morgan. Yeah. Know? Well, I got to put in a plug for Henry Red Allen. I, I listen to Henry Red Allen all the time. Uh, and, you know, he was, in some respects, the other great trumpeter, along with Armstrong, who grew up in Algiers, uh, made his mark in New York, traveled the world, wonderful player, but also a, just a delightful crooner. Uh, listening to him sing Take Me Back to My Boots and Saddle, which is an old Western song, you know, like a Gene Autry number. He just gives it the, the most beautiful, melodious quality. And you almost feel yourself on a horse under a Western moon heading into Cheyenne or Cherokee. Uh, so, Megan, I think if my computer is correct, we are at 130. Um, 
is that are, are we done or do we keep talking i will we are at your service well that time passes quickly <laughs> Hello, everyone. I'm Candice. I'm the producer um, for yeah. this event. Megan um, had to go to the next event because it starts at like right now at 1.30. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, uh, we are at the end of this event. So if y'all just want to wrap up, if there's any last minute things, I know, of course, we want everyone to visit the virtual bookstore to buy books and things um, and donate to the festival. But if y'all have anything else, just go ahead and, and wrap up and we can be finished. Okay, well, I'll say two two very quick things. One is even the, the COVID situation today has been inspiring a lot of songs. And the second thing is I anxiously uh, look forward to and recommend that everyone, when, when this film comes out, City of a Million Dreams, be sure you watch it because it's one of the most important films, not only on New Orleans music and culture, but on American music and culture. Well, Michael, thank you for the plug. Uh, it's been a pleasure for both of us to be with you by this visual format. And hopefully in years to come, we can, we can go back to the old way of uh, speaking in rooms with people and taking questions. I would ask you to uh, think about getting a copy for yourself, City of a Million Dreams. I think you will be happy. It's been a great pleasure for both of us.